Yeah, uh, so it's my pleasure to announce uh, the talk of uh, Elizabeth Arayo, who is the who is our president and uh, really a very active member of the society. Uh, she is uh, teaching in the Valdesilla University in Spain and uh, uh, deals a lot of uh, uh, things in the in the medicine. Uh, so uh, I'm really very much interested to hear uh, her uh, lecture and all the the conditions which she reached in the in the little short time in the Spanish uh, oncotherapy applications. Please. Thank you so much. Uh, I I'm going to see if I can share my screen. So here. Great. Okay. So so thank you so much again. Please, uh, anyone, let me know if you don't hear me or if you don't see the screen properly. So I'm going to speak uh, about a trial which uh, is a really exciting trial. Uh, I'm not happy with what I am going to present because we don't have still enough, but I, I would like to show you what we are doing uh, regarding this because I have uh, spoken in the last meetings uh, about this trial and we are on it, but with some problems up to now. So. I work, as uh, Professor Sass said, at University Hospital Marques de Valencia in Santander. This place is interesting because it's not a very big city, but it has a very big hospital with a lot of things. We have a radiotherapy department where we work 62 people. We are 11 radiation oncologists. We have uh, three linear accelerators with external bit radiotherapy. We have radio surgery. We have extraterrestrial radiotherapy. Um, we have two operating rooms for bracket therapy for HDR and low DR. We are the first public hospital in Spain with a modulated electrohyperthermia device. And this is very exciting but because we are going to be the first public hospital in Spain with proton therapy. I think it will be ready in one year and a half or two years, something like that. We also have a, a very important um, collaboration with uh, another center, which is uh, very close to the hospital, which is uh, Virtual Hospital Valdecilla. It's a pioneer center in Europe in the use of clinical simulation for the training of health professionals and the improvement of patient safety. There we have, for example, a Da Vinci robot only for training. So you can imagine that that center for training is really, really good. And uh, that center works in collaboration with the Center for Medical Simulation in Boston. And we also have Edival Research Institution, which is, it was awarded by the Spanish Institute of Health, Carlos III, as one of the reference institutes for health research in Spain. So what I want to show you is that in Valdecilla, fortunately, we have a lot of possibilities to do research, and that is something very, very important for us. So we have since July 2019 a uh, modulated electrohyperthermia device. You can see it here. I, I must say that I also work at another private center, center where we have another free modulated electrohyperthermia device. So that allows me to have more patients to see results and, and, and making some studies. But, you know, COVID is, is in our lives since 2019, more or less, it began at the end of that year, beginning of 2020, and it has stopped a lot of things in our lives. And especially in science, because you know that a lot of research has been stopped or delayed because we, we couldn't do it because, because of this uh, pandemic. So if you see, for example, this publication from 2021, uh, the impact of the COVID pandemic on the care of cancer patients in Spain, you can see that 
the number of new cancer patients decreased at 20%, more or less, and the inclusion in clinical trials decreased by, by around 30%. But if we are thinking about uh, modulated electrohyperthermia, uh, we, we needed to try to, to stop the trial because the problem is that we are using the same device for, for all the patients in the same room. And that for COVID was a very important problem because, you know, cancer patients are patients which are not in the best conditions. So a COVID situation for them was a, a, a big problem. So uh, the hospital decided to stop treatments with hyperthermia during the pandemic. So in 2018, I, we, I was presenting at the ICHS meeting the future studies that we, we, we will, would have in Valdecilla Hospital in 2019. Finally, we began with the, with the studies. This, 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 the first trial we began is the treatment with modulated electrohyperthermia in high-grade gliomas. Uh, grade 3 and 4 as an adjuvant treatment to a standard radiotherapy and chemotherapy or as a unique treatment or combined with chemotherapy only. I will, I will show you now some, some results. So the question now is that almost the two years after beginning the study, what happened? Because uh, we tend to think that if we don't see results, is because results are bad, and that's why the researchers are not going to publish those results. But this is not the case. So I, I, I would like to show you this tip of the iceberg, but finally this year I would only show you that very little tip of the iceberg because uh, we don't have enough results yet because of, of this pandemic situation. But I feel the pressure for different parts asking what happened with the trial, what happened with the trial, and I don't want people to think that the trial is going bad because that, that is not the case, but we don't have a lot of patients yet. yet. So this is a prospective randomized trial to evaluate the possible benefits in terms of control of disease of adding modulated electrohyperthermia to a standard treatment in glioma stage three or four patients, and also evaluating a modulated electrohyperthermia in monotherapy or in combination only with chemotherapy when the patient progresses. To a standard treatment. So we, we would like to analyze radiosensitivity, chemosensitivity, the improvement in cancer cell killing. So our inclusion criteria was patients, of course, able to understand and sign informed consent. All the patients need to be uh, more than 18 years old. The Karnowski stage uh, has to be over 70. We need confirmed by pathology high grade glioma uh, stage three and four. Uh, and we have uh, two types of patients newly diagnosed patients or patients with relapse or progression. So, what I am going to present today, the update on this phase three trial, are patients diagnosed with who grade stage uh, three or four glioma at University Hospital Marques of Valdecilla, who were recruited in the phase three medglio trial between August 2019 and March 2021. So the problem, the main problem is this, due to the COVID situation and some technical problems, but mainly the COVID situation, we had to, start, to stop the trial for 18 months during this period. So as you can imagine, we don't have a lot of patients yet. So we have like two arms in this study. And uh, arm one are patients at first diagnosis randomized to control group, which is a standard treatment with pemesolamide plus radiotherapy. Um, the experimental group uh, who received a standard treatment plus modulated electrohyperthermia. We perform five tasks times a week. 
30 minutes before radiotherapy uh, with one hour treatment and the power which we use was between 45 and 60 watts. And then we have another arm in the study who are patients with progression after a standard treatment treated with modulated electrohyperthermia in monotherapy or concomitant with chemotherapy. So these patients receive modulated electrohyperthermia three times a week, one hour treatment also and with the same, the same power. So as I have said, we stop for a long time long time so we still uh, just have 26 uh, patients recruited so it's, it's not much. So if we go to R1, so patients newly diagnosed for uh, glioma grade 3 or 4, we have uh, both groups, uh, the standard treatment or the standard treatment plus modulated electrohyperthermia. So we recruited 14 patients Eight were randomized to the experimental group and six to the control group. We excluded uh, four patients for this report, three because they did not begin or complete the treatment. Two of them were for the experimental group and one for the control group. They did not complete the treatment mainly because the tumor was a very advanced tumor and they, they couldn't stand the, mainly the radiotherapy treatment or they were in very bad health, condition, health conditions. And we also had a grade 3 glioma in the experimental group, but I decided that for this presentation, due to the low number of patients recruited and in order to make more comparable groups, uh, that grade 3 patients was excluded because all the other ones was, were grade 4 patients. So finally, we only have uh, 10 patients, five in, in each of the groups. So I, I know it's not much. The average age in the experimental group is 53 years old. In the control group is 61. In both groups, one of the patients had IDH status positive. And the follow-up was a little bit longer in the control group with almost uh, 28 months uh, compared with the experimental group with 22 months. So here we have overall survival. So you see that in the experimental group we have another so by 12 months of 11.3 patients, we cannot conclude anything. We only see that it seems that the experimental group is doing better, but we cannot conclude, unfortunately, a lot of results about this. So um, we, we did not see any toxicity or differences at three months uh, from the treatment because survival was the same in both groups. Uh, at six months, it was a little bit lower in the control group, but you know, this uh, again, we, we have a, a very little number of patients. So if we go to the other arm, so in which is patients under progression after standard treatment, treated with uh, modulated electrohyperthermia monotherapy or concomitant with chemotherapy, we recruited to 12 patients Two patients did not complete treatment because of very advanced disease. Two patients were treated in monotherapy and they showed no response. I, I must say that they were very advanced tumors with a very limited Karnofsky, so uh, I, it's not surprising for me that they, they didn't have good response. And eight patients were treated with modulated electrohyperthermia plus chemotherapy. So uh, mainly uh, the patient received potemustine uh, as second line therapy and only two patients received one temozolamide and the other one uh, bevacizumab, the antiangiogenic therapy. So from these patients, 50% uh, of the patients after treatment progress and 50% responded. So uh, we have four patients with good results 
Two with, were treated with team. One is alive after seven months and showing with response. One died seven months after beginning hyperthermia. One treated with bevacizumab died six months after beginning hyperthermia. And the other one treated with temozolamide died 6.4 months after beginning modulated electrohyperthermia. So the scheme for the treatment in these patients uh, in all but this one, this one who is still alive with uh, seven months alive after the beginning hyperthermia. In all the other ones, we did a four weeks treatments with hyperthermia concomitant with chemotherapy. Then we waited for eight weeks to have an MRI to see what's going on, what, what was going on. And if it was okay, if the response was good, uh, then we went on with more treatment with hyperthermia again for four weeks. So in, in these cases, we stopped for eight weeks to see what happened. At the beginning, uh, we are having problems because we have uh, many patients and it's difficult to manage with, with the device. So that stop uh, was uh, for different reasons, but we wanted to see if the treatment was working and then going on. We, we, we thought that maybe a stopping was not good. So this was my my feeling uh, from the private and the public practice and that's why uh, in the we, we think that glioblastoma is always there so maybe treatment should be always there but because if we stop uh, glioblastoma is going to be back so in this patient who is still alive after seven months and who is showing very good response we did not stop stop treatment so it's only one patient and I know it's not enough but my feeling uh, when I treat patients outside the trial at the private practice that we are also treating some patients is that if we stop at the time we stop is when the patient is going to progress so uh, because of this now we are thinking about changing trials protocol in order to go on with treatment until progression, not waiting after four weeks treatment and see what happens in an MRI eight weeks after that. So uh, going on with the treatment because I think that stopping is not a good idea because this tumor is very aggressive and is always there. So I think we always need treatment, especially if we if we think that this treatment has no major toxicities and, and is not so hard for the patients. So the toxicities we saw were minor toxicities, less than 5% of the patients had light headache for less than an hour. They didn't need any treatment for that. We didn't have epileptic seizures and we didn't have crazy or so that is very important for us because it allows you to prescribe the treatment for a long time without uh, being uh, concerned because of toxicities. So conclusions. These are the first preliminary results from a phase three trial comparing standard treatment versus standard treatment plus modulated electrohyperthermia in patients diagnosed with high-grade glioma. So I, I don't think that if the results are bad, we will publish in the results anyway, but uh, we don't have conclusion yet. yet. We, we didn't publish or present it anything because we still have a very low uh, number of patients. So uh, the pandemic has delayed research in a lot of uh, places, so um, we don't have the conclusions. Both groups seem to be comparable. The experimental group seems, seems to have better results regarding overall survival. And uh, what is very important is that adding a modulated electrohyperthermia to the other treatments did not increase toxicities. And of course, we need more patients and follow up to rise conclusion. So just to finish, you still have to come to Spain for a meeting or for anything because those meetings have been online. And thank you so much. And I am open to any comments, suggestions or anything. Thank you, thank you so much.
Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. It was really a very, very nice uh, talk. And uh, despite of the pandemic situation, which was really a shortage of everything in every country, it's not only in Spain, in Hungary, I know closely that uh, also we had the same situation, but you reached uh, uh, good results, I think. Uh, at least uh, the message is that one, that it's, uh, it's useful to continue because you have some indications that it could be helpful for the patients. And that's, that's the real point for, for everybody. The other message which I had, uh, had got, and, uh, and I am very much interested for this one, you have turned for one patient uh, from the, uh, from the uh, real, let's say, deathly uh, uh, disease uh, to the chronic one. So you are treating the patient like a chronic disease, like dialysis or something else which is again a new uh, facility uh, for, the, uh, for the future. So please continue and, and let me see that what hints you have for the, uh, for the real medical applications. So thank you very much. Uh, I had seen that Ayas wanted to ask something. So uh, uh, Ayas, are you here? Uh, no. I, maybe we can read it. Uh, yes, I am. I am uh, here. Great. <laughs> so thank you very much. That, that was a very nice and clean design. Uh, rather fast experience with glioblastoma, but in a totally different clinical setup because my practice is a small international practice uh, uh, in, or in integrative medicine. But let's go to my, my point. Uh, progression upon stopping the treatment brings up again my question, my previous question about the duration in humans. So we have to address that one way or another. We cannot notice. Yeah, I, I think we are losing you, Ayas. Uh, Ayas, are you there? But I think I, I got your message that you are again asking about the duration of the treatment in humans. Um, my experience outside this trial is that uh, we are treating patients with uh, glioblastoma for more than one year and they are doing okay. But we, we didn't stop the treatment. They are coming to the clinic twice a week, every week, but they are doing okay. And, and we have two patients that uh, are being treated only with this in monotherapy uh, for more than one year and they are doing okay. So the, the tumor is not growing at least. So that for me is, is very interesting because you know that uh, GBN is always growing, is a very aggressive tumor. So I think it is very important that maybe and in the same way that a chronic patient with another disease needs a chronic treatment, we need like a chronic treatment for these patients. Maybe I am sure or I, 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 I think that we will have a progression uh, maybe soon or later, but uh, we are like having very good results with their treatment, surprising results. And my feeling is that if we do a, a very a short treatment, especially in gliomas, we don't have very good results. We have good results at the first MRI, but during that stop, then the tumor begins to grow again. So I think it's very interesting to analyze this, if maybe in this type of patients, we need a longer treatments. But again, I agree with you that we still need to know a lot about duration in humans. So thank you. Um, I'm very happy. I'm very happy because, because my experience is exactly the same with glioma, I mean, patients. You, you stop it, you lose the patient. Yes. So yes. <laughs> let's yes. treat it as a chronic disease. And this is big achievement in oncology. If we manage to convert a malignant disease into a chronic disease, this is a big step for humanity. Thank you. Yeah, so, so thank you so much for your comments and, and experience because that is my, my feeling, but I, I am happy to, to see that more people is, is thinking the same. I. 
I also have a comment uh, from Professor Van Gogh. I, I don't know if you want to speak. You are asking something. Uh, what do you mean with concomitant with Fotemish team? I, I yes. will... uh, thank you very much. Uh, you are here together with Dr. Uh, Dr. Suri. So yeah. concomitant means, in my eyes, in fact, uh, like with the radio chemotherapy just before the radiotherapy, but with uh, Fotemostin, of course, it is one dose in each six weeks. Are you then at least this one session of hypothermia placing just before the swallowing of the tablet and continue, or is this word concomitant a little bit more broad? Yes, it's more broad. Yes, is the patient has has uh, his chemotherapy, and then on the next day after chemotherapy, we have a treatment with modulated electrohyperthermia. What happens is that as we don't stop the treatment, is is every uh, twice a week or three times a week. Every week, the patient has chemotherapy uh, every four weeks in our hospital with Fotemustin, so, but it's not the same day, it's in a different day. Yeah, but also, also on that, I'm quite scared, so I will also elaborate in my talk on this uh, chronic phase. I want to reflect also on the Berlin message uh, on uh, non-thermal effects on tumor cells, uh, on the idea of the immunogenicity that you maybe create. I have always been very anxious in combining immune stimulating approaches with uh, chemotherapy approaches. And I always have placed the um, immunogenic approaches quite shortly after the chemotherapy, when the chemotherapy is gone out of the body, but not just prior to the next chemotherapy, because if you stimulate your immune cells at that time and you come in with your chemotherapy, your proliferating immune cells are very sensitive to the chemotherapy. So maybe in future, but we, we will have the chance to reflect together again, but maybe for the whole community, we, we can maybe start thinking on this scheduling, putting more dense hyperthermia sessions shortly after chemotherapy, so that the immune system can do something and not just before the next chemotherapy, so that you kill your immune system with the chemotherapy. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for your comments because probably that that is is true and is interesting. The problem we have at the hospital, for example, is that treatment for the medical oncologist with the chemotherapy is in the morning, and we need to treat the patient also in the morning. So, and at the end, a lot of days we don't have that time because the patient go out from the medical mm -hmm. oncologist at two p.m. We, we cannot treat them because what I would love and, and I don't know what you think about this is in, not in, in GBM uh, mainly but in other tumors I would love to have the hyperthermia treatment during the chemotherapy treatment so the, the chemotherapy treatment going inside and the patient there for me maybe that can be very interesting I don't know what you think about that um... I'm less experienced with uh, the dueling word. So as I said, we at the moment place uh, about two to three days after the chemotherapy, we come in with the hyperthermia. As an example, if one patient starts with the five days stimulant on Monday, the week after on Monday till Friday, we give the five days uh, with, the, with the hyperthermia. So, so, but I can surely imagine that during is also very good, but one should take into account, for instance, if, if one gives the infusion of the law of, of, the, of the chemotherapy, or if one swallows a, a tablet of CCNU, um, it takes a time uh, before it goes into the uh, tumor cell, and only then the intracellular anti-cancer activity starts and influences the tumor cell. And the effect is only visible if the tumor cell divides. So I don't think the hyperthermia with the chemotherapy should be 
very close, but might be even better if it is just after, because then the working of the chemotherapy intracellularly is happening. It might be different from chemotherapy type to chemotherapy type, but I can at least imagine with the alkylating agents that you have to wait till the cell divides and experiences the broken uh, DNA due to the alkylating agent, that then the cell is in suffer and, and that then the hypothermia can do something more on it. Just an idea. So it's really this, this combined dosing and scheduling is an issue that we have to, to work further on and maybe the Berlin team can, can help in, in such an approaches. Yeah, because I was thinking also in the non-thermal effects, which sure. really takes uh, some hours. So I, I was thinking, which is the best, the, the best approach? Because I don't know. So I appreciate your comments because I, I think it's an interesting field of research. Mm -hmm. also. So, yeah. So thank you so much for your comments. Thank you. So, I would yes. like uh, to add something. So. Uh, I think that uh, one of the important factors of the chemo drugs is the pharmacokinetic parameters of the drug, which is very different on different uh, uh, diseases and different chemos. And uh, generally, all suggestion that uh, give the uh, 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 modulated electron hypothermia in the phase when the drug uh, penetration, so it means that the pharmacokinetic peak is on the top. So it means that uh, somehow uh, we are expecting the best effect when, when the, uh, the uh, penetration of the drug into the cell uh, is the highest. But maybe that uh, uh, combined with the complex immune uh, effects and all the complex uh, micro environment of the tumor cells, maybe that we need a, a different timing, but it needs research, it needs study, which we have no presently. Yeah, so thank you so much also for your comments. I think it's great because I learned a lot from all of you and, and these meetings. I think we, we need a meeting every three or six months. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>